Hey all, uh, as promised, I'm going to go over the last two labs that we did to give you an idea of what your results should look like and where uh, you might have lost some points and what the overall gist should have been. And so the first lab is the penny, the coin tossing lab. Um, and that's where you flipped a coin, you had a bunch of treatments of different numbers of coin tosses, and then you were to write that out in uh, a distribution. Um, the other lab was the gecko lab, and so in the gecko lab, you were actually taking data on the behavior of this gecko over time. Uh, so, so that was, uh, you, you did a really good job on that lab collecting data. I think almost all of you collected really, really solid data. You should have ended somewhere with something like 30 observations on the dark and 10 on the light. So as long as you got uh, that much, you did gather a lot of, most of the points for the lab, um, if you got that far. Um, the last part that was really the, the crux in trying to get all of the points would be to do the, the chi-squared test correctly all the way through and get the chi-squared statistic. That would get you almost perfect score. Um, but then to actually get that statistic and find the p-value on the chart. And that was described in the video. It was a little brief, but um, it's also in your lab manual. But we'll do it again here so that you can have an idea of what that full work through of that lab should look like. So we'll start with the coin toss experiment. And this is really like a probability um, exercise. And you took data on the number of heads. And then you did the number of heads over flips. And so you did treatments for example one, two, three, four flips, five flips, and let's say from there you did 20 and then you did 50. And just for, for the example, let's say you did 100 after that. Then you made a graph and this graph had one, two, three, four, five. And what I liked, you could have just, after making your graph like this, you could have just done your 20 treatment here and your 50 treatment here. And let's say you did 100 treatment, do that. You could make your graph like this, but what some of you did, which I thought was really smart, uh, was that you spaced it out so that it gave some idea of the scale here. So what I mean by that is let's say you did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you said 10, and let's say you did 15, and you put your 20 like way over here. Right, and then you did your 50 like way over here. So that's cool because that gives you an idea of how many treatments you would have had to done to get to those levels there. So for this treatment portion over here, you are basically for each treatment, you're flipping the coin that number of times. So for the first treatment, you're flipping the coin once. And let's say you got heads once. That means your heads over flips is one over one, so that gives you a probability of one, or 100%. For this next treatment, and this is, this is where some of you started getting confused, for this next treatment, you are flipping the coin two times. Um, this could result in either no heads, it could result in one heads, one tails, or it could result in two heads that is random. So let's just say you got two heads. So you got two out of two. So then again, your probability would be 100%, right? At three, something like that could occur, or maybe you got zero heads. So then you got zero out of three, so then you got 0%. So these are all pretty typical uh, examples of data. At four flips, you could have gotten any number of combinations of heads. Let's say for this example, you do one, one out of four, so that is a 25% chance. And then for five, let's say you got four heads, so you got four fifths. When you got to 20 flips and 50 flips, this is where your distribution should be getting closer to 50%. Well, for, for 20 flips, you usually get anywhere from seven to 13 heads, but it's usually pretty close to half. 
So maybe you get 9, so you get 9 out of 20. And for 50, you should also get something close. So your 50 treatment should be somewhere around um, 25 flips of heads. Let's say you got 26. So you got 26 out of 50. 45. This is 52. As you go up in treatment number, you should get closer and closer to 50%. So let's say this, we got 55. If we got 55 out of 100, that's 55%. What you should end up with is uh, a graph that has a lot of kind of variation in the beginning. And then as you get higher number, it should start to converge on 50%. So your graph should do something like this. It might not look like that on yours. It might have a little bit of movement up here and then go over here. Um, but essentially, your graph should converge on 50%. So kind of the ideal graph would be something like that. If your graph didn't have this shape where it started getting more and more close to 50%, and it wouldn't ex it doesn't always have to go exactly to 50%, you know, it could be 55%, 45%, maybe maybe even 60% if you have some more air going in there, but it should start to converge somewhere around 50%. Um, that's, that's what your graph should look like, and that is what you should expect. The probability distribution uh, looks like that for any number of treatments. If you keep doing treatments over and over and over, they'll all start to do that. They'll all converge and you'll end up, let's say you stacked on a thousand different treatments, what you'll end up with is a shape kind of like this where there's a lot of variability over here but then as you get closer to a hundred or closer to an infinite number of flips it starts to get closer to 50 percent. So how could you miss points on this? Well for one, you could have missed the treatment area. So instead of doing this, you could have done treatments one, two, three, four, and this did treatments all the way up to 50. Um, that's too much data. That's not what we asked for. Um, you could have done uh, an incorrect calculation here. So instead of doing um, number of heads over flips, you did flips over heads. That would give you incorrect data. So instead of Let's say for this example, instead of four-fifths, you could have written five-fourths. That would give you uh, an incorrect number. That's an above one probability, which is not something that we'd be, uh, we'd be looking at. And then another way is if your data didn't appear as though you did the experiment or you didn't do it correctly. So what does that mean? Uh, if you got a trend, let's say that looks like this, This is not something you would expect. Likewise, if you had a trend that looked like this, this is also not something you would expect, and these things are outside the realm of realistic probability. Another unlikely scenario is if you just had a bunch of tosses that were all around 50%. That's not something you would expect. You would expect a lot of variability in the beginning, and then as you hit 20, it'd get less and less. Another thing we wouldn't expect is all super positive values or all super negative values. So any one of those, there's, there's some error somewhere. Where the error is, I don't know. But if you were to do these coin toss experiments in a very controlled environment, you wouldn't get data like that. It's much, much more likely that you would get data that had a lot of variability in the low treatments Maybe you know you, you cruising over here and over here, something like that. Uh, and but then it starts to get less variable as you go up towards 50. For the gecko experiment, remember we're doing a chi-square test, which is a summation of observed minus expected squared over expected. And so in this experiment, you should have two data examples, two data set examples, one of which is your observed, which should have a dark light. Uh, you should have around 30 observations in the dark and around 10 in the light. 
and then your expected. This is this is expected under the null hypothesis. So this is the expected data if there was no difference, and that would be 20 and 20. So plugging these values in, remember we have summation, and I'll do the calculations in, let's say we'll do it in blue. Um, what you should get is for, for 30, right? We should get 30 minus 20, remember, because 20 is our expected, squared over 20. And remember, this is a summation, so now we're going to do the same thing for the light treatments. So our expected for, I mean, our observed for the light treatments is 10, and our expected is 20 squared over 20. So what does this equal? So we get 10 squared over 20 plus 10 well, negative 10 squared over 20. So it's 100 over 20 plus 100 over 20. So that is 10. So your x squared value is equal to 10. This is your, your chi squared value. But this isn't the end of what you're doing. This is just your, your chi squared statistic. You still need to look at the table to get your level of significance. And the table is in your lab manual. We'll pull it up here. So here's your chi-squared statistic. Now we need to find your critical value. So first, let's look at these. how this table is split up. We have two different areas. We have the hypothesis is supported, and then we have the hypothesis is not supported. When we talk about the hypothesis, we mean the null hypothesis and this is a little confusing and I understand that um, so when we say that we're supporting the null hypothesis what we're saying is that we support the hypothesis that there is no difference between treatment groups that's like this example this is the null hypothesis right there's no difference between treatment groups this is our observed treatments Right? This is what we measured. So we're basically comparing what we measured with what we would expect with a null hypothesis. That is not, there's no difference, right? And what we want to know is if there's a difference between these groups that is beyond the level of chance. Remember, if we just did this experiment and there was no difference between the treatment groups, just like with that coin toss experiment, there would be some variability, right? So like if you're expected is 20 dark and 20 light with no difference between the groups, and, and if that was the case, right, let's say we didn't actually have um, a dark side and a light side, let's say we had both the same color, light side and the light side, the gecko would probably distribute itself without really much preference for, for either side of that chamber, right? But we probably wouldn't get 20 and 20. We might get something like 21 and 19. Right, because remember, whenever you're taking a sample, um, it's unlikely that you're going to get the kind of theoretical probability. You're probably going to get some close approximation, but it's probably not going to be exactly like that. Just like with the coin tossing experiment, you know, you're you're not going to usually get ten heads when you flip it twenty times. You might get nine, you might get eleven, but it's usually not ten. The next thing you should look at on this table is this area right here. These are all the values that are chi-squared values that you might get, right? These are all different chi-squared values. So we got a chi-squared value of 10, right? Chi-squared equals 10. So where do we look on this table? Well, because we have two treatment groups, our degrees of freedom are 1. And that means we're looking on this column right here. We're looking at these values right here. Right? Um, the reason why our degrees of freedom are 1 is because basically if you have two treatment groups uh, and you know what one treatment group is, then you automatically know what the other treatment group is because there's one left. Right. So if you have 40 different possibilities and you know that 30 of them are dark, 
now that you've you've revealed that 30 are dark, you automatically know that the 10 remaining are light, right? So that means that that last observation is actually not free to be any random number. It's kind of locked in. So that's called a degree of freedom. So because we have two treatment groups, we actually only have one degree of freedom. Our chi-squared value is 10. So if we look on this, if we look here, we will find our value is right around here, right? It's right around here. So what does that mean? That means our hypothesis is not supported. This is our p-value. See, there's a p right here. So our p-value is equal to 0 0.001. This is the likelihood that this happened by chance, right? So there's only a 0 0.001 chance that we got 30 dark and 10 light treatments due to chance compared to this uh, this expected outcome, right? So let's say we got 19 and we got 21 observations, right? Then there's probably, we'd probably get a p-value over here, right? There's a high likelihood that this is insignificant differences and we just got differences due to chance. Well, that's not what we got. We got these big differences, 30 and 10, and there's only a 0 0.001 chance that this just happened randomly, right? So what does that mean? So that means this is not good support for our null hypothesis. What's our null hypothesis? Well, remember the 20 out of 20 treatment? That's our null hypothesis. So there's only a 0 0.001 chance that this, this treatment should have been 2020, right? So what is nature telling us here? Nature is supporting our observations, our data is supporting the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is a no-go. It's not supported, right? Our null hypothesis is not supported. Our alternative hypothesis is that the gecko prefers one side over the other, or however you would write that. Uh, in this case, it prefers the dark side, but what we really tested is if there's a preference for one side over another. So to get full credit for the gecko statistical analysis, you had to report the chi-square statistic. You had to actually write this out, and that was very explicitly said in the instructions. You also had to report the statistics, which are the chi-square statistic and your p-value. You also needed to state the significance of the p-value. You had to state what the p-value meant. You had to state which hypothesis was supported and um, basically give me a clear signal that you are understanding this whole process through and through. But now that you've worked through the data and you've given it a try and you've seen it worked out in front of you, it might kind of lock in now and you might say, oh, I see what I did wrong. This is not that hard. Um, or you might be more confused than ever. And if that's you, uh, you can see me at office hours and we can go over it again. Fridays from 3 to 4, we have open door office hours and you can just use that link on the canvas and find me there. That's your time and that's when we can go over this stuff in a million ways and in ways that make more sense to you.